wonderful book called Just Enough. I recommend it highly to so many. And over the last 10 years, I have been so blessed in this friendship and also in his wisdom to understand that King's legacy may be uh, a yet to be. It may be that those of us who worked with him have deserted the path he had us on. And the question is, is there a legacy of Martin Luther King yet? And if so, where is economic justice? Uh, Dr. Uh, Stevenson Howard, it is a delight to have you uh, lead us off in this great undertaking. Well, thank you, Virgil. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to go through, I think I'll spend about 30 minutes and we can open up for questions, but uh, I'm going to take you on a tour of my intellectual life. I started in entrepreneurship, uh, developing that course at Harvard Business School. Then I spent some time on what Virgil was talking about, which is a very interesting question. Why is it hard for successful people to have successful children? And that leads you to what you mean by success. And then most recently, I've been doing work on social impact. Uh, I've, and I'll come back to what I've done and why it's interesting and relevant to this uh, discussion. On, you say, what about, why entrepreneurship? Well, I think actually Martin Luther King, by my definition, which seems to be used around most of the academic world, is one of the most fantastic, fantastic entrepreneurs that existed. Now, I define entrepreneurship as the pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources you currently control. Now, let's parse that. What's an opportunity? Well, it's a desired future state that's different from the present. I'd like to be young, rich, and handsome, but that probably isn't possible. Uh, two of the three might work, but, uh, well, actually, only one of the three might work. But on the other hand, and I better not try and be a basketball player. So defining an opportunity for me uh, was using my gifts and trying to uh, actually create some change in the world of business education. It also, the second part is, is equally important. Belief that achievement of that state is possible. If we look back at Martin Luther King's life, we discover, in fact, he defined an opportunity that was ignored by most other people. At that period, it was an era of Jim Crow. It was an era of uh, putting down for a lot of people. And he said, I can make a difference. And in fact, wow, he did. Now, the second part of this is, so I think of him as a great opportunity who did not control the resources. He wasn't a television star at the beginning. He didn't have a Twitter account. I mean, there are all sorts of things he didn't have. And yet over his life, he made a great deal of progress towards his goal of social change. Now, I'll just briefly digress into, okay, what does that mean? Recently, I spent a lot of time, we spent the last two years, because I was interested in what the graduates of Harvard Business School do to have social impact. Um, I, can, I could bore you with a lot of facts, but people think Harvard Business School is rich because we have a great philanthropic base. But in fact, our graduates give about 20 times as much to other institutions. So we went out and inter we collected about 1,200 stories. We interviewed several hundred people. We did a survey of our graduates. And when you got through, there were two things that came screaming through the data. One, they didn't go out with a great moral cause. They said, I saw a problem and I thought I could do something about it. There was a great deal of practical thinking that, you know, I don't have the resources to do everything in the world. What can I do that I can make a difference? Now that may mean Michael Bloomberg is spending $50 million a year to get gun control, or that Hans Jörg Wies is trying to save, has created the two largest gifts of land to save land in Patagonia, or it can mean my friend who hasn't been tremendously financially successful, but he plays a mean banjo and he goes to nursing homes every week, or it's the, uh, and makes up songs about the uh, residents to their great delight. Or the woman who is an investment banker without a family who said, I want to make a difference. 
And so she's arranged her schedule. So every Friday afternoon, she goes to the inner city and reads so to the kids. So I think that what we have here is a question of social impact. But when we got further into it, we saw a great deal of difference and really three different kinds of social impact people were trying to have. One is symptomatic relief. Ralph is worried about libraries in Malawi. Other people stand at food kitchens and give out food to the hungry. I mean, we have a food kitchen right at the corner of where my office is. And there are people that do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. In many cases, they would say that's what they can do because they have the time and the skills and the passion for it. So symptomatic relief is one form of social impact, and we would never diminish the importance of that. Feeding the hungry is a tremendously important thing, and I, I believe in the ministry of Christ, he actually mentioned some of that. A second form of social impact is the search for root causes. Now, I believe that things like, my wife started a group called Summer Search that's helped about 3,000 inner city kids graduate from high school. This is a, a group that uh, has about a 30% graduation rate. And in the cohort that they've helped, it's 98%. And these aren't the brightest kids in the world. These are kids who have demonstrated that they care about other people. And out of that 98% college graduation, they have 72% that have grad, or 98% high school graduate. They have 98, 72% that have gone on to a four-year college. Amazing results compared to those who hadn't been helped. Now, there's also the question of poverty. What's the root cause of poverty? Well, there are many, many causes, lack of education, lack of distribution of wealth, et cetera. But it turns out that one of my friends, who was the first case on an African-American, I think written at Harvard Business School, and I wrote it 35 years ago, started to work, worry about why is opportunity missing from our discussion. And he got involved in the politics of, shouldn't we all be talking about more about opportunity? Well, he discovered as he did this, that in fact, there was one very evident source of poverty. And that's an unwanted pregnancy between the ages of 15 and 25. So Mark went out, and I've been involved in trying to help him raise money and do a bunch of other things. I guess I'm chairman of the audit committee or something like that. But Mark went out and said, okay, why, is there so, why are there so many unplanned pregnancies? If you don't know the statistics, they're frightening. State of Delaware, under the rules of the collection of the Title X clinics, 57% of the pregnancies in that age group are defined by the mother as unwanted. Now, there are two solutions. One is abortion, and the other is not getting pregnant. And Mark's view is we ought to make sure that every child is wanted. And this meant creating a platform and looking at why there are so many unwanted pregnancies. And the answer is, in fact, uh, our birth control methods are very ineffective, that the pill is about 50% effective over five years, and we can laugh at the condom as an effective thing other than the protection against sexually transmitted disease. But in fact, in Europe, there are many, many fewer unwanted pregnancies. And that's because they use what they call long-acting reversal contraception, uh, IUDs and uh, implants. Well, Mark has actually said, well, why is that? And he said, well, after studying it, they said, oh, the clinics, it's easier for a doctor to write a prescription. Even though it's ineffective, they think they've done their work. So he started a training program that he uh, tested in both places like uh, his alma mater, Exeter Andover Academy, and he also did it in Title X clinics. And what they discovered, they had to educate every single person on it. Well, you know, that was great, except he, well, he said, now what would happen if we went to the state that had the worst problem, Delaware, and we trained all the clinics in Delaware? So with the help of his friends, he raised enough money to develop a training program and has now put it in every clinic in Delaware. 
guess what? Only a year and a half out, they've cut the unwanted pregnancies from 57% by 15%. An amazing result. Well, this is getting at the root cause. It's one of the root causes, education, clear another, uh, tax policies, another. I could go through a list. But Mark said, I can do something about this root cause and make a difference. And by the way, in a test, we also cut the abortion rate by 76% because nobody aborts a wanted baby. The third element is social change. Yeah. You know, that's one of the hardest things, and that, of course, was the focus of Martin Luther King. You know, I don't know what he did on the uh, symptomatic relief. I think he did not develop a system for root cause analysis, but in fact, he created great social change. You know, if you think about Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, that brought the environment in being, uh, the, some teachers have an ability to bring about and inspire. I had one math teacher that in a rather lousy high school, probably 80% of his students wound up with advanced degrees because he was a great teacher. And that hopefully has led to social change. I certainly give him the credit. And by the way, this is a fairly normal process of people being interested in symptomatic relief, looking at root causes, and then trying to achieve social change. I have a friend who has been very, very successful. He started by saying the kids in his hometown weren't getting well educated, particularly the poor ones. He then decided that he could give scholarships to go to Catholic schools. He gave 5,000 a year, that was $30 million, but he can afford it, and brought kids to what he thought was the best educational system in the city. It happened to be that he was Jewish. But then he said, oh, wow, this is not working. I can't afford to do this for every kid. What can I do that's different? And he became the major funder of Teach for America, trying to bring about an analysis of maybe the root cause of poor education was bad teaching. And if he could get great kids into the classroom, even for a short period of time, he could bring about a solution of the root cause. He then uh, did this for a number of years and felt it was very successful. But he said, I'm treating these kids unfairly. And he said, I'm putting them into situations which are lousy systems. What could I do to help? And he created something called edu uh, education, Leadership for Educational Equity. And what this does is train the graduates of Teach for America to run for school boards. And he's gotten 183 kids elected to school boards who are graduates of Teach for America. That's one form of social change. There are many others. You know, the whole politics, I see more and more of my friends that are going from, uh, you know, philanthropy to 501c4 to get social change because they believe ultimately it's going to be the only way that makes a difference. But I, let's focus on the social change because that was where Martin Luther King was so brilliant and so great. Now, Virgil asked me an impossible question. Was he successful? Well, you know, success is really a hard problem. I think Aristotle wrote about it 4,000 years ago. Herodotus before that, Herodotus had a rather morbid way of viewing it. He said, count no man successful till he dies. So what is success? That's a question that we've been asking forever. Some of it comes out of a religious view, some of it comes out of a social view, but it's, is it a state of being? Or um, am I successful or not? Well, that's a tough one because I could be successful in some areas of life and not in others. One of the things we did is we wrote cases about four different individuals. Uh, Jimmy Carter, President of the United States. Catherine Graham, owner of the New York Washington Post, uh, Nelson Mandela, whom we all know, and Donald Trump. And we ask which of these are successes. And you know, you can say that all of them were successful in some dimensions, but all of them had some uh, things that probably at the end of their life they wish had done differently. So it isn't I'm a success versus I'm not success. You have a unique combination of activities, feelings, and accomplishments. And some of them you feel really good about, and some of them you're a little worried about. It also could be thought of as a collection of scores. I was successful when I 
applied for the state math contest in Utah. Then I went to Stanford, discovered I, that didn't matter. Uh, so what we discover is success is very hard to measure. It's often uneven. As soon as you say, I am successful, you're on the road to uh, default. And so it's never frozen in a moment in time. Now, why is success such a hard problem? I think the easy answer is because it's the measures are both internal and external. You know, the measures aren't the same. Do I feel good about myself? Well, you know, I don't think Ernest Hemingway would have committed suicide if he'd felt really good about himself or drunk quite as much. Obviously, things change. One of the things, one of the challenges Virgil is proposing is, okay, how is the world different now than it was 50 years ago? What do we have to do differently because we have a different kind of president and we have a different economic world? At that point, we were at the top of the world. Uh, now, we're the largest creditor in the world. What does that mean? By the way, you change. Uh, Virgil doesn't look exactly the same as I saw him in his pictures when he was standing next to Dr. King. I certainly don't have the energy that I used to. I'm 77 years old. I've had four heart attacks. Uh, you know, so I have to change the things I do in order to maximize my impact on the world. And by the way, even what I want may change. Uh, in 1969, I had zero kids. Then I had three kids. Then I married a woman with four kids. So I have seven killed children. One time, I, one year, I got to pay tuition at Columbia, Yale, Harvard, Williams, and Bowdoin. Uh, I was both proud of that and scared by it. But in fact, my world has changed because of the nature of change in my family. There's another little problem, which I call the wince factor. Many of us feel it hurts when you see others experiencing success that we could have had. In my life, I gave up an opportunity to make a tremendous amount of money to stay on as a teacher. You know, the person who stayed on and took over the business that I started has probably made 15 times what I've made. Now, do I wince? Yes. Do I wish I'd done it differently? No, but I still think about it. What would, how would the world be different if I'd gone down that path? And there, what you have is sort of the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. So when we look at this, what we did is we interviewed 150 people, and they were successes by any people, anybody's standards. Now, they may not have been the Donald Trumps. I tried not to interview him, excuse me. But the common characteristics of our interviewers, interviewees were that they were high achievers in multiple areas. They weren't one trick ponies. You know, uh, you look at the story about John Paul Getty, he may have been one of the richest people in the world, but let's see, he didn't help his grandson when he was in need. Another factor we saw is they cared about others and their success seemed to be enduring. It was much different than the uh, notion of, well, I'll do it now. They wanted to make a difference in the world to many others, and they kept going and growing. But one of the things that was very clear, and I think it's very clear for each of you to ask, well, doesn't success have to reflect my values and my uniqueness? I'm different. you know. I think it was Peanuts who said, be yourself, everybody else is taken. But the people we talked to had great personal satisfaction from what they'd accomplished. Now, what we saw is there were, we asked people, don't tell me why you succeeded because everybody gives you the same nonsense. I worked hard, I foresaw the future, I was blah, blah, blah. We asked people to tell us about successes in their life. And what we saw was, there were four very different kinds of success. There was achievement. What do you do against external goals others are striving for? Money, power, fame, uh, athleticism, you know, accomplishments that you can identify and say, I won the competition. You know, we see in some people that that's all that matters is that they win the competition, no matter what damage they do otherwise. The second element of it is, of course, Significance, what have you done for other people? Um, 
you know, positive impact on the people you care about. One of the scary facts of life is Bill Gates can only give $10 a human being. That will make a difference to nobody on this phone call, I'm sure. But in fact, what he's chosen is who does he help? How does he help them? And how will he use the bulk of his wealth not to create something that is a legacy for him, but really have the legacy be the living result? This is what we're talking about today. Then there's happiness. How do you feel about yourself and your life? You know, again, I go back to Ernest Hemingway, but happiness is a funny thing. Most people who succeed are slightly neurotic, I would argue, that we have an itch that we continue to scratch. We're not quite prepared to say that's enough. And uh, therefore, we continue to scratch that itch, which gets us less happy, but more achievement. And the, the, the final thing is legacy. What have you, have you established your values and accomplishments in a way that helps others find future success? And that's probably the discussion for this um, jubilee. Now, it is complicated. You know, if we just take achievement, for example, uh, is it about what I've done or is it about what I'm doing or what's possible? Is the time frame the past or now or the future? You know, the emotional drivers. They can be positive, mastery, recognition, pride, or they can be somewhat uh, negative, envy, greed, and fear. They will both drive you to achievement. And what's the impact? Is it on me or others? All of these things are contradictory. And in fact, when you think about the success drives we all feel, they actually serve very different emotional needs. You know, if you think about achievement, it can be as I mentioned, recognition, pride, mastery, or it can be externally oriented of envy and greed. If you think of significance, it can be fairness, generosity, caring, or power and self-aggrandizement. We've all worked in organizations which are nominally for the benefit of others, but we really see people who are acting out of their self-interest. Can it be happiness? It can be their contentment and fulfillment, or it can be the kid whose parents say, I want you to be happy, and they give him enough money to go to, to Vail and ski. And he comes out and says, what are you doing? And he said, well, you told me to be happy, Dad. I'm really happy. What's your problem? So, and even legacy has some funny things. It's altruism and generative desires. Or it's a fear of death that I want to live on forever. I'll write a thousand-year trust and a need to control the next generation. I remind my friends that each child has eight great great grandparents so they're not to say that's my family is an arrogant statement beyond belief so when we look at this you know there there's a hope on some people's mind that doing one thing if they have achievement eventually they will find significance and then legacy and then they'll be happy if that's sort of a success it, it doesn't work uh because basically, uh, it's rare you can find one activity that has it all, and different skills are required to be loving and caring than it are to achieve in a, a tough competitive environment. And they're different contexts. And as we see often from studying kids, there's collateral damage. There's another set of things that are written in some of the books that I don't like about a sequential approach. One way of saying it is learn, earn, and return. Well, you know, that I'll, I'll achieve and then I'll do significance and then I'll be happy and then when I die, I'll leave a legacy. The only problem with that is who wants to not be happy till you die? Uh, what's enough achievement? You know, is there ever enough money? Is there enough money for now? Those are very different questions. It's uh, what, are you missing any opportunities? You know, the cats in the cradle, that Cat Stevens song, of the kid that uh, the parents ignored. I mean, there are so many different ways that a sequential strategy fails. I mean, how many people wait for their second family before they learn what it is to be a parent? Um, 
So as we think about it, the enduring success that we saw in people was thinking of success as a journey of a lifetime. You know, as I mentioned, I've died four times, uh, literally once where I was flatlined. But in fact, I don't want to wait. I want to do what I can do while I can do it. And what we have is a notion that, in fact, success comes from juggling. You know, we achieve, I go to work every day and I want to do as much as I can. But when I go home, I ought to leave my work behind and be with my family. And when I'm with my family and leaving them, I ought to make sure that I'm doing things that I, give me a smile on my face. I mean, I love to have a lunch with friends. You know, I, that's only an hour out of a day or 45 minutes out of a day, but it's one of the most important times of my day. And then legacy will happen. You know, Bill, our, our president who said, I want to control my legacy, it's crazy. You don't control your legacy. Your legacy is controlled by the people you leave behind. And this juggling act is a really important part of enduring success. It's a, you know, when you think about jug, people talk about balance. You know, I always think balance is a seal with a ball on his nose. Uh, I think it's more of an active form of juggling. And what do you do when you juggle? You got to keep your eye on all the balls. You don't just focus on one, and if you focus on one ball, you're bound to drop the others. You have an, when you touch a ball, you have to give it energy. You have to throw it, but you have to release it. You can't just hold on and say, nobody gives you a, a great applause for holding on to all four balls when you're juggling. But you have to practice, and you have to throw it carefully and in the right direction with the right speed. And the most important thing is you have to catch the falling ball. And in life, what you see is that some balls are made of rubber. If you drop them, they'll bounce. But other things like family relations, personal relationships are often made out of crystal. If you drop them, they're going to shatter irretrievably. So the focus of life is that you basically have to recognize that your balance among these things or the, your weighting of these things is going to change. If you don't achieve when you're young, it's really hard to leave a legacy. I mean, again, we go back to Dr. King. He started as a great preacher and he expanded the, uh, his environment much more broadly than anybody would have thought in the era before the mass communication social media. And it's an interesting thought experiment as to what he would do in the face of today's social media how he would have managed his career differently, how he would have managed his life differently. All of you are listening can say, okay, I am probably not going to uh, win by trying to uh, absolutely replicate what he did. First, you can't. Uh, the world is different, the laws are different, the social environment is different, the young kids are different. Those of us who were active as uh, protesters in the 60s, um, you know, probably that's not a good thing for a 77 year old to do right now. So when we talk about success, and I wanna come back to Dr. King in a minute, but one of the problems is you can't have it all because things change. If you talk about Virgil's question, what has changed that's positive? Well, there are a lot more, there's a lot more attention to the needs of other people, at least among a certain group. I won't talk about Washington right now. Uh, there is a lot more law that's backing the cause. There is a lot more discussion and dialogue among people about what is right, what is good, and what is their role. So when you think about success, one of the things is a reason sense of enough. That isn't to say, I don't care about doing more. What it does say is, I want every day to make identifiable progress. You know, what have I done today that made the world slightly different? Because that gives me the energy and I can put something down with satisfaction if I feel I've made a change. I can see different and new benefits from the next activity. So the one trick pony is probably not as going to be as happy as others. And 
but if you can in fact define enough on both what dimensions am I working on today? What's, their, what's the time frame of judgment? All of those things become important. So enough connects choices and values and action. It sets limits. I don't have to work 70 hours a day. Uh, in fact, if I do, I'm almost bound to leave some things that are very important behind. It allows transaction, but one transitions, but one of the things, having a sense of enough motivates. And I believe that, you know, the question of how many people show up at your rally or how many of people have I fed today, um, all of these things are tremendously important. And, but each of us have to define our own view of enduring success. What is our satisfaction in which domain? Do we want to find satisfaction? I think the second element, element of it is we need to uh, look at ourselves in a hard way and say, am I on my way to success? On your, am I on my way to my ideal? And you, are you satisfied with the way your current success reflects your core drivers? I had a wonderful experience of a man come up to me the other day and said, you changed my life. I didn't know who he was, but he apparently was a former student. They said it was around this definition of success where he said, I've made him enough money. Now what am I going to do to change the world? And we also have to ask our self the question in a, a very detailed way. Uh, are my emotional drivers positive? Am I doing this because I want because of ego needs or because I want to make a difference? Am I doing it to self-aggrandize or to help somebody else? Am I finding happiness because I'm lazy and gluttonous or am I finding happiness because I'm truly helps me be content? And when we get to the legacy question, and this is one that's really hard, what is the legacy? Whose legacy is it? I would submit that, yes, we could give credit to one man, but there were a lot of people marching shoulder to shoulder. There were a lot of young people that got involved who made a difference and whose once the young people got involved, their parents couldn't back away. Yes, it required great leadership, but it also required great followership. And the way that we should give credit not only to Martin Luther King, but to all the people who went his way, saw a difference, and attempted to make a difference in the world because of his example. So as a teacher, I would give a take-home exam for each of us. Who are we? You know, I go to uh, Hillel who said, if I'm not for myself, who am I? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? And I think those words of the famous Jewish scholar were absolutely critical. You know, one of the questions for all of us is what satisfactions are we on the way to missing? You know, I don't know, I didn't ever know Dr. King personally, but I suspect there were some things that he missed in his life. And yet he was driven enough that many of us believe in him and want to follow him. One of the questions for each of us, who's important to us? And are we helping them to succeed? The only way we create legacies is helping other people to succeed. And sometimes achievement personal achievement is contradictory to building a legacy. And then the question, what's my time frame for action? Virgil and I are a little older than most of you, I suspect. And so, you know, I don't buy green bananas uh, because if I want to eat them, I better make sure they get ripe quickly. But in fact, the one thing about this test is the time for the test is the rest of your life. So if we go back to the question that we were asked at the beginning, has he left a legacy? Sure. Just the very fact we're having this conversation is a legacy that is tremendously important. We also have the legacy of the social change. Is it enough? No. Is the income equality harmful? Yes. Are we, you know, if I gave away all my money, I've given away a very high percentage of it. Um, I was raised in a tradition of tithing and I've blown through that a long time ago. But in fact, when you um, think about it, what, am I, what resources do I have that make a difference 
in the thing in the problems I think are important. So I think the introspection for introspection for all of us is what's important to us, what resources can we bring to solving the problem, and what are we going to do to make a difference. So with that, I think I've used up my 30 minutes and uh, be glad to open it to whatever Virgil tells me to do, like I always do. Wow, Howard, Howard, Howard. I would not want to have come through this world and have missed what I've just heard the last 30 minutes. Absolutely elegant. I'm sure we have people online who would want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, converse with you. Uh, I'd suggest people not take a long time to state what you want uh, Dr. Stevenson to respond to. And I'll say real fast, and if you'd leave this to last, Howard, one of the things Martin wanted to do, he talked about um, uh, redeeming the soul of America. And I talked with someone who will be on later with us, Dr. Delamont Tang, who talks about the soulfulness of nations. And if a nation sees that it has a heart, and uses the heart is in people like you, Howard Stevenson, and we have ancestors whom we are celebrating and what uh, at Virginia Tech and Virginia Union we call the Beloved Community Ancestors Hall of Fame. I think this is the time now for uh, listeners who would like to... Uh, uh, to speak with uh, with uh, with Howard to have their opportunity. Well, while we're okay, go ahead. Someone was on. Looks like Siobhan wants to ask a question or give a comment. Siobhan. Just unmute. Hello, I'm not sure if someone else is attempting. This is Ryan Hulbert out in Idaho. Fine, Ralph, come on, yes. Good to hear you, speak. <laughs> okay, it's actually Ryan. And uh, I've very much enjoyed the message you've given Dr. Stevenson, I am uh, 62 and I have what I call a magnificent obsession, but my wife thinks that it's not so healthy obsession. <laughs> and uh, we have a close relationship, but uh, day and night I'm focusing on various things to try to help people and I wondered if you have any advice for me on not necessarily keeping a balance, but uh, prioritizing those balls that I'm trying to juggle. I think I'm muted. Um, you know, you, you're facing the classic dilemma, which is there are 24 hours a day and we have a limit to brain cells. But I think part of the question for all of us is what, who is important to us? And we can't announce that only the outsiders are important to us and have it feel good for the insiders. On the other hand, one of the things I learned in life, I've been a busy life, and as I mentioned, I have a lot of kids. I've learned that uh, the juggling really involves two things. One is knowing what the balls are, and two, paying attention to them. So. One of the reasons enough is important is if you can set enough for today, you say, I've done enough work for today, therefore when I go home, I'm gonna pay full attention to my family. And by the way, when I leave my family behind, I'm gonna pay full attention to my work. Many people sort of mess those things up and they are thinking about their family when they're at work and they're thinking about work when they're with their family. So my first advice is, you know, with my kids, I. I sort of learned that, uh, okay, it's gonna take me the same amount of time to fix a toy, uh, whether I do it now or later. So if the kid asks me to fix the toy, I wanna do it now, because that will say they're important to me. And by the way, that also lets me say to them, you know, I, aren't we a mutual aid society? And if I need help, will you help me? So there are messages we send by sort of not giving full attention to the person in front of us. 
And that's a trained behavior. I think one of the things that, you know, in addition to having ADHD, I think one of the things that I was always pretty good at is shifting focus. Somebody asked me, how long does it take you to relax when you go on vacation? I said, 15 seconds. Because in fact, that ability to shift focus from uh, working hard to being relaxed is a tremendous skill that you can develop with, uh, with practice. Great, thank you so much. I, I remember a technique of juggling that I thought had a great lesson. It is that you literally just have one ball in the air at a time, even though there's the motion going on. Well, great you know, jugglers have three or four balls in the air, just go to Cirque du Soleil, but they always have to pay attention to the falling ball. And I think if okay. you think about your question, there may be a falling ball that uh, you got to focus on. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That really helps me. The next. Dr. Stevenson. Go dead ahead. This is Owen Cardwell in Richmond, Virginia. Um, long time colleague of Dr. Virgil Wood and a long time admirer of you and your work. I especially enjoyed the book written about you, how its gift gave great insight. Um, you mentioned in your talk um, about root cause analysis. Here in uh, Richmond, um, the uh, Commonwealth's Attorney's Office is doing a root cause analysis uh, that's involving the entire community around gun violence. Um, I think it's critically important if we're going to address uh, some of the issues that are facing us, that, that that process be a serious process. What recommendations would you have for localities to be serious about uh, conducting root cause analyses? Amen. I mean, part of the challenge we face is 50% of the guns are owned by 3% of the people, according to statistics I've read. And, excuse me, uh, did he push up? The one, one of my sons has just walked through. He was talking to somebody else in the office. But, uh, you know, I think that the root cause analysis often is very difficult. You know, what is the cause of gun violence? Is it alienation? Is it, you know, some people would argue it's the availability of guns. Massachusetts has some of the strictest gun laws, and it has the lowest rate of gun violence per capita in the United States. Um, you know, that's not something that even the federal government would fund the study on, but it's people like Michael Bloomberg are funding those studies and showing it. Now, whether we have the courage to stand up to the people that say uh, the, the answer is more guns, um, that's a question. But the root cause analysis, and I, I go back to the example of upstream, that root cause analysis of shifting from abortion is everybody's right to don't you want every baby to be wanted, just that change in language is tremendously important. Whatever your stand is on gay marriage, the, uh, they won when they changed the dialogue from this is the right to don't you want your loved ones to be with the people they love. And that has led to a cascade of uh, changes in the law and changes in the attitude. So the way we talk is tremendously important. And I think gun violence is, uh, you know, I think we're seeing with 78%, I think it was, I saw this morning, that are we want more gun control. Then we have to talk about why, and it's because don't you want everybody to be safe? And the, the Gabby Giffords of the world are, and even the Ronald Reagans are example one of why we need to get deeper into it, not to mention the 17 kids at Parkman or the three kids yesterday in Maryland or, you know, we can go on and on. While we're waiting for another uh, discussion, I would like to, Howard, if you would say a word about um, the heart and soul of nations. 
I mentioned that Dr. Robert Delamonte, who's done an analysis on what he calls each soul has a, a unique temperament, like people of the nine, those who are familiar with the Enneagram studies, that we seem to be born with a certain uh, predisposition and the entire human uh, family is represented in all those nine types. He's identified uh, 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 those types among nations, those nine. We'll be discussing that later during the, um, during the summit. But if the soulfulness of a nation and the right lobe allowed to enter the conversation with the left lobe, uh, Martin Luther King, for me, represented the, white, the right lobe. In other words, why should we have a beloved community and a beloved economy? But what he did not have was the how. And I wonder what you would say about um, the importance of the how to the why. Well, you know, there's some very interesting books out. Uh, there's one by Jonathan Haidt. I think he's was at UVA on the righteous mind about how hard it is for people of goodwill to talk to each other if they have basic differences in their beliefs. There was another wonderful book called uh, White Working Class that sort of is arguing what what happened to us in 2016. Um, but from the perspective of somebody that could have written um, the uh, oh one about Appalachia. Uh, but in fact, I think the sole question is really, how do we get an effective dialogue so it isn't a dialogue of the deaf? I mean, throughout history, people of goodwill and great religious faith killed each other because they couldn't enter a dialogue about what we share in common. And I worry about, uh, you know, I, I even see some organizations I care about where when they start throwing accusations out, it's divides, it doesn't, and you're not gonna bring somebody over by telling them they're evil. And so I think part of what we face as a challenge is we have a very bad example of somebody that's dividing, but throughout history, that's the way demagogues worked, is they, they tried to divide and get enough people on their side that they could, uh, beat down the others. Uh, I would argue that that's true in most countries. But what's interesting about this, Virgil, is I have a general theory of everything, which I wish I had a blackboard. But if you think about two things, money and power, they're different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Money at the bottom is very competitive. If you don't have it, you'll compete away everything so you can feed your family. Power at the bottom is actually quite cooperative. That is to say mobs and unions form because the combination of people is much stronger than the uh, sum of the individuals. Money at the top is actually quite cooperative. And, you know, as being involved in a lot of not-for-profits, what you see is that people with money really care. I mean, I, I'm amazed at the amount of money our graduates give even though they're you know they they have to be first at the dump on Saturday morning but they want to be they want to make a difference but power at the top is very competitive number one and number two almost never agree because if number one agrees with number two he or she has given away power and I think part of what we have to do if we're trying to create change is call out the question is this about power or is it about purpose because purpose is the same as money in some ways. It can be cooperative. But power is very, very dangerously competitive. And what you see in a world in which, uh, you know, even in the not-for-profit world, there's a battle between the executive director and the chairman of the board or the, uh, the preacher and the community. Power just destroys the ability to cooperate. You know, that reminds me, uh, Howard, of uh, Tillich's contribution to this, Paul Tillich, Love, Power, and Justice. And I think about one of the missed opportunities uh, that we had in the Civil Rights Movement was that um, Martin said it himself as he summarized coming to the end when he was saying, where do we go from here? He was almost reminiscing, if you 
knew him close up and things he really cared about. He he was on a track to some things that he really felt he didn't want to do, like the Poor People's Campaign. He really didn't want to go to Washington. And I know that because he told me that he should have gone to Wall Street. There would have been a discussion at Wall Street about how do we uh, make money flow from the top to the bottom and allow the uh, earnings of capital to be available to workers as well as wages of, of, of their work. I guess my question is, if you look at um, Betty Sue Flowers' wonderful mon um, monogram on the economic uh, American dream and the economic myth, I suspect your analysis that you've just given us helps us to understand how we balance, do the balance between love, uh, love and power and that comes out to be justice in the middle when love and power are in balance. I think that may be one way to think about justice. And uh, we have uh, about 10 more minutes, and I, uh, if no one else is on the line, maybe you would uh, speak to that a little bit. That would be helpful uh, to the well, side. You know, they, they say money is the root of all evil. I would argue if you look at history, power is the root of all evil. The lust for power, not the lust for money. Now, I'm not naive. In some countries, power gets you money, and in our country, money gets you power. But I think that the question of how do we call up, in, manage, in working in not-for-profits, I've discovered that it's actually quite useful to call out when somebody is arguing for their own power and say, is this about power or is it about are we creating the purpose we came to, uh, we intend to do? And that discussion is uh, very vital because most people won't admit uh, that they're in it for power. And so when you call them out on it, you can start to say, well, if it's about power, then this is the choice. But if it's about purpose, how do we work together? I, I remember one not-for-profit that I was involved in, and uh, they'd never done any strategic planning. And I sort of said, maybe we ought to do it. And they came back, and uh, it was a pretty lousy plan. And I said, you don't talk at all about competition. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't know how many people are trying to do the same thing we're doing in the same geographic area. And so they went back, and they came back, and there were 39 groups working in the same area. And they told me how bad they were and how much better we were. And I, I turned to them, I said, you know, either you're wrong or I'm stupid because I'm giving money to 11 of these 39 groups because I think they do a good job and in some case a better job than we do. So how do we cooperate with them rather than simply trash them? And it, you don't have to love people, but what we discovered is if we co-housed with five of these groups, we actually could cut our costs and do more and we actually entered into very constructive dialogue. And so I think that's the, you know, trying to get people to understand this is not a competitive, it's not dividing up the pie, it's how do we do a better job of our purpose? And if our purpose is the sort of constitutional purpose of pursuit of happiness, then we'd better start thinking about how do we cooperate? How would you just describe the hope that uh, Owen Codwell and I have worked together since 1962 when he was 14 years old and led uh, the youth branch of the civil rights movement in his city of Lynchburg, where I was a young pastor of one of the leading churches there. And when I first uh, uh, joined with Martin Luther King, also across town at the time, there was another young preacher by the name of Jerry Falwell who was uh, doing storefront ministry at that time. Fast forward to uh, the uh, turn of the century, uh, Jerry Falwell, Owen, and I, Owen Codwell, and I co-sponsored a summit in Lynchburg on reversing the jail trail and jump-starting viable economies. And uh, we are anticipating that our, as co-founders of the Jubilee National Collaborative, we have been able already to bring about 12 national and a myriad number of local uh, groups together. And uh, I have to uh, sing the praises here uh, of Virginia Tech at Blacksburg that uh, gave me the opportunity to 
uh, fast forward a bit King's legacy possibility and Virginia Union University, my alma mater, whose president at the time I was a student there was John M. Ellison. He wrote a book called Tensions and Destiny, and in it he was the first African-American scholar to lift up the importance of beloved community. It was the first voice to say beloved community. Now this project called Beloved Community Initiative has the young people of the state of Virginia competing to do an essay uh, on, um, we have 40 pairs of people who are looking at, uh, who are being looked at as ancestors of the beloved community. They are not the only ancestors, but these are the ancestors whose, uh, whose energy speak to my spirit. Uh, and in the American big story, every time the moral arc of the universe bends and bends toward justice, there is the impact somehow of a black person and a white person, uh, like uh, Leon Sullivan and um, Lyndon Johnson, for example, or like Fred Douglas and Abraham Lincoln, or like uh, Harriet Tubman and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the great minister of Israel, whom I love so much, Golda Meir, who said that we will, uh, we will, uh, if we will. Um, be able to, if we can love our own children more than we hate our enemies, we can create this kind of society that we're talking about. So I think with the remaining minutes that you have, if you would help us to uh, uh, kind of have this focus, I want to thank you, uh, Howard. You are absolutely one of the greatest of all times. And please, please allow me to say this because I am so, I'm so overwhelmed by the depth of your wisdom and the breadth of your love and spirit. And I just have to say that because it's like when I walk in the morning and I see a, a flower blooming and I have to stop and talk to the flower and say, you are so beautiful. Thank you for being here to bless our world. Well, I wish my parents were here. Oh. Praise God. I wish my parents were here because my father would have enjoyed it and my mother would have believed it. Um, <laughs> the you know, it's interesting you use the word justice because there's Rawls, John Rawls wrote about justice in one way, which uh, is that uh, any decision should advantage the least advantaged. You have Bentham that says the greatest good for the greatest number. That's actually an incomputable thing because how do I trade off great harm for one person for modest benefit for the other or the other way around, which is, seems to be the way the economists, I can do a small amount of harm to many people as long as it's okay for me to get the benefits. Uh, you have sort of Kantian justice, which is what are the duties? Uh, I would argue that part of our problem is everybody likes the word justice, but they don't in fact have a, well, almost a Habermasian dialogue on what does that word mean? Because is it, is it a quality of opportunity? Is it a quality of results? Is it a quality of access? I mean, there are so many things. I mean, one of the things that I think my friend that started Upstream got frustrated by was, okay, what does even the word opportunity mean? And I think a lot of what he has been able to accomplish in life has been by getting a dialogue around what opportunity means and what are the impediments to it. And that's a hard thing because many people claim a word, but they actually don't define it in a way that shows whether the people listening agree or not. Howard, I want to, on behalf of all those who will hear you now, who hear you now and who will hear this, uh, give you my deep thanks, and I want to pledge to you that as we go forward in this year, my team, the Jubilee National Collaborative, and all the rest of us, as we seek to launch what we are calling the Martin Luther King Jubilee International Year of Economic Justice, it starts on April 3, not April 4. April 4, we should be mourning so that on April 5, we start the, the one-year journey uh, probing these issues so that on April 4, uh, 2019, 
America on the 400th anniversary of, of the sordid business of its original sin will, will have found its way back to its original intent, which is a nation uh, that reflects the city on a hill. And again, our deepest thanks, and I know that I'm joined in this by countless others who will hear this or will hear about it. Howard, God bless you and thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, it's been a great honor to speak with you and others about the challenges we all face. <laughs> so thank you and I will sign off then. Indeed, God bless, bye-bye.